Welcome to the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast and welcome to just outside of Amsterdam in Holland. Uh, here we are at the International Nuclear Cardiac and Cardiac CT meeting and we've got lots of really interesting and extremely unusual um, uh, people to interview of interest for the podcast. I'm sure you're going to love it, so I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Let's go straight to the first interview. We are at uh, ICNIC again and this time we're dealing with heart disease in the elderly. Um, but uh, this time the patients are getting very elderly, about 4,000 years elderly. <laughs> um, and, uh, um, and we're going to be talking to some very interesting people who've done some very exciting research on, uh, on looking at uh, heart disease in, uh, in ancient Egypt. Now, I'll let them tell the story. So perhaps if we could uh, work along the, the line here, uh, introducing ourselves and telling us about how each of you have played a role in this uh, exciting experience. So I'm Greg Thomas, and I'm a cardiologist at UC Irvine, and was uh, fortunate enough to be uh, in the Cairo Museum with the Dalai Lam uh, three to four years ago, and we came up with this crazy idea that worked out pretty well. I'm uh, Randy Thompson, a cardiologist at the um, Minnebrecker Heart Institute in Kansas City in the United States. And uh, my uh, field is cardiac imaging, and including cardiovascular CT. I was delighted to be involved also. Uh, uh, Dr. Thomas and Dr. Lom uh, saw a placard in the Cairo Museum that one of the ancient uh, pharaohs had atherosclerosis, and they didn't believe it. And I agree with them. I didn't believe it either. <laughs> so we... We embarked on this uh, um, interesting trip. So uh, Adal Alam, professor of cardiology at Al Azhar University and chief nuclear cardiology at Alpha Medical, and uh, a partner in this lovely piece of work. Well, how about if we start about um, what happened? What what did you do? Well, we went to. Uh, we had the idea that. Um, the question, did these ancient Egyptians have atherosclerosis? Um, as Dr. Thompson said, there's a placard in the museum that says that an ancient Egyptian who was one of the sons of Ramses, the second Ramses the Great, had atherosclerosis. And so Dr. 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 Lam and I didn't accept that. Um, and so we came up with the idea of doing calcium scores on them. And it turns out that there is a CT scanner um, in the museum grounds at the Cairo National Museum, which is right next to to here square, which is where they had their revolution recently. Um, and the so what we did is on two expeditions, um, scanned 20 mummies and then 22 mummies um, at the museum. Uh, we were given some other mummy CT data. So we uh, ultimately came up with 52 data sets, we think is the largest collection of CTs of mummies in the world. And these mummies live between uh, about 1800 BC to uh, about 300 AD. Uh, over that period of time, and then we um, looked at them over a period of years, trying to understand what we were looking at um, to delve into: Did they have atherosclerosis in their vessels, and did they have it in their coronaries? Right. Well, um, um, did they? <laughs> well, they they certainly had it. Our first paper we published in JAMA about a year and a half ago, we showed that um, they had atherosclerosis, and when you got to forty, predominantly um, the predominant of, excuse me, most of the mummies over 40 by far had atherosclerosis, and we documented atherosclerosis by calcification. That was one of our hypotheses that we'd have, that the calcification might just stay there. You know, as when we came up with the idea, we thought, you know, calcium, tough, you know, uh, tough element, could it still be there over all this time? And so then we looked at it, and we could see, some cases we can see calcification in the artery wall, other cases we could see calcification where the artery should be, like down in the bifurcation, for example. So we found they had what predisposes to coronary disease and stroke atherosclerosis. And then as we got better at looking at these mummies, because there's no book about how to do CTs of mummies, um, in terms <laughs> of what they look like, you know, the structures are, look different, we got better and better at it. So we realized that among our 52 mummies that two of them definitely had coronary disease, um, one probably, um, and then 18% of them also had carotid uh, disease in the form of the calcification here. So we were as Randy said, quite surprised that they would have this kind of disease 3,000 years ago. How can so. we know that they really had this disease? How do we know it's not an artifact of mummification, for example? Uh, good question. Well, one is it looks just like 
the disease in modern human patients looks. And uh, what is amazing is that uh, this technology the ancient Egyptians developed uh, preserved the body so well. We're looking at 3,000-year-old bodies, and we see the aorta, uh, structures that are recognizable. And when we see the uh, calcified plaque in those vessels, it looks just like the calcium that we see in atherosclerosis in the aorta or the major arteries in modern humans. And we've, we've shown these images to radiologists and cardiologists who are used to looking at it, and they, assess, and they all say, oh, yeah, that looks like what it is. The other way we are, are convincing that, convinced that we're looking at atherosclerosis is that uh, it's in the same location from mummy to mummy, and it looks the same across 3,000 years, 2,000 years of mummification. So the technique changed over time, and yet even with different techniques, we still see the same disease, same locations. Uh, and, and there is um, some <clears throat> pathologic correlate from 100 years ago uh, showing atherosclerosis, and we think we've kind of rediscovered what was found and forgotten way back then. Even more importantly, <clears throat> I think, uh, as Greg said, it correlates with age. And we know that, that this disease in, in modern patients is related to age. What was even more interesting is that a part of that the presence of the disease correlated with age, the severity of the disease correlated more with age, which was was, was, was even more interesting. Uh, and another important thing <coughs> is that in 85% of our mummies, we could detect cardiovascular tissue. So this is a big percentage. And not all the arteries had disease. So I mean, if it's an artifact, why should part of the artery would be free and the other part would be diseased? when particularly those are the sites where we could get disease even right now right. in modern civilization. So the tissue's there. I mean, what, they, we, uh, mum, do mummies have all tissue or just heart? <coughs> or what, what, what's actually in a mummy that makes so they're, they're all snippets of artery. So right. there, no, no mummy had all of the cardiovascular system present right. uh, or, or big parts of the cardiovascular system. They're all little short uh, snippets, but the, we, we learned that there are areas where we could find the artery. For example, the aortic bifurcation, the popliteal arteries behind the knee. Uh, we knew where to look in the carotid arteries and that kind of thing. Um, so people ask us what, what percentage of mummies had atherosclerosis. Well, remember that we didn't see the arteries in all of them, and we didn't see all of the arteries in any of them. So that's a little bit of a, uh, a challenge. Yeah. Um, but Was the disease better or worse than what you'd expect to see in modern people. So despite all that, it still looks like we see an awful lot of atherosclerosis. The fact, even though you can't see the vessels, yeah. and even though it's a bit of a select sample, it still looks like there's a lot of atherosclerosis there. And I, in addition to what Dr. Alam and Dr. Thomas were saying, we had a couple of mummies, yet they, had a, they just were arteriopaths. They had so much disease in so many parts of the body that we thought, surely they must have had symptoms. Surely they must have been... Uh, sick from this and having uh, strokes or heart attacks or about right, to right. just based on how diffuse the disease was. But I thought that atherosclerosis was a disease of modern man brought about with type 2 diabetes. I mean, does this mean this is all wrong? I think that there's, I think we're missing a risk factor. I and mean, I think that there, well, they didn't, for example, they didn't have tobacco. Presumably they were active. Now we did only image the affluent as the affluent were the rich enough to be mummified. The reason to be mummified was actually that way you got to stay in heaven. If you were good on earth, you got to go to heaven, but you needed a body to come back to periodically. So uh, they, these, um, so they had, some of them had, they did have meat in their diet, um, but they didn't obviously have trans fats. Um, no. their, and their risk factors look pretty mild. We don't know their blood pressure, we don't know their diabetes status, but I think that if we look at the classic Framingham risk factors, those are the risk factors that we could measure 50 years ago, or 60 years ago when Framingham started. You can measure blood sugar, blood pressure, height, weight, cholesterol, and I think that we're missing something. Right. And why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we be? For example, we, we, and there are patients we see that we say, why do they have heart disease? No, they don't have any of these risk factors. So I think there's a missing risk factor here. Well, we think of mummies as being pharaohs and so on. I presume these aren't all pharaohs. There are other people. But um, uh, is, 
Is it because these are affluent people that they're sitting around uh, without doing exercise like modern man? Or is it because they're they are pharaoh. Pharaohs marry their sisters, I believe. Right. That's correct. Right. 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 Um, is there some sort of genetic inbreeding that's caused problems here? Well, we didn't scan the pharaohs. That was that was actually uh, not allowed. We did, uh, as it turned out, have a couple of mummies that were members of the royal family. Dr. Lam can elaborate. Uh, uh, <clears throat> one that we showed in detail was the uh, sister of a Queen, so make yeah. her a princess. Princess Ahmos Mareit Amon, which uh, she is the sister of uh, King Ahmos, one of the very great kings of Egypt. Uh, and at the same time, she is the sister of the queen, which is Ahmos Nefertari. And again, she is a very famous queen for Egypt. And uh, I think she's the most interesting because we can say that. Uh, is probably the first reported case of coronary artery disease in the history of man that we know of. So, so this is a princess who lived around 1550 BC and turns out her family was the family that turned from, began the new kingdom. Right. Her father started the war against the foreign rulers from Thebes yes. and then her brother, her half-brother, you could have more than one wife at that time back right. then, um, so her half-brother um, uh, became pharaoh after the father's death and then um, um, was able to expel what they call the Hyksos, the foreign rulers, to start the new kingdom, the great golden age of Egypt. Exactly. So she was, she was the, the daughter of the king and sister of the, the king. And, um, and the, the issue of people uh, mirroring each other, that kept the money and the power in the family. Yeah. It was pretty yeah. straightforward. You know, why not? <laughs> um, but we did see, so one of these issues, is there a genetic issue there? For example, we've also imaged her grandmother, um, who also has coronary disease, excuse me, also has atherosclerosis, rather diffuse. So, but on the other hand, so we've got one family with disease, and, but on the other hand, over 2,000 years with multiple changes in mummification over, over that period of time, people, there's still atherosclerosis in multiple people along the way. So it's not just one family right. line. That but a, right. a mummy span over 1,800 years, and so right. that's, that's not right. the same gene. I mean, obviously, it's not the exactly. same. So, I mean, there are some genes like, what well, Marfan's or things like this that, right. that, that, that could, uh, could, you know, cause those sorts of uh, problems. Did you see any particular, apart from the calcium, did you see any other things that might indicate uh, heart disease? Yes. Lady Rye. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> uh, we, we, our, our paper was the first to describe mitral annular calcifications in ancient people. That's, that's oftentimes a correlative atherosclerosis. And uh, we do have one mummy where there's a dense calcification in the inferior left ventricular myocardium. Uh, looks like all the world like an old heart attack. Oh. And we uh, don't have proof, correlation. We finally come around to the consensus that's what that is, or probably what that is. Um, we, it looks like a calcified old myocardial infarction that we see on modern human patients if the, if the heart attack is dense enough. And that's, the, that's also an indication of atherosclerosis and heart disease. We also found, interestingly, that just, again, the diffuseness of atherosclerosis that we saw in so many people. By the time you got to be 40, you generally had atherosclerosis in the aorta and, the, and going down the iliacs and peripheral vessels. But and we tend to use calcium scores here, and that was our initial idea. Let's do a calcium score. But actually, I think we're look. We may, as we think about nuclear and CT and how we merge the two, um, we've thought about we do calcium. We're thinking about doing calcium scores on patients with myocardial perfusion, but we may be looking too high. Mm -hmm. right. We're looking for early atherosclerosis. We may, may mm -hmm. well, based on our our other data, when you delve into it, it's the bifurcation where the atherosclerosis tends to start. So we again saw that very often as people getting older. And then as they got older, we saw more coronary disease, more um, carotid disease. And so just because it's uh, in the heart doesn't mean that's, that's our first sign of what, right. of, um, you know, starting the secondary prevention program, for example. Right, but I mean, what messages does this tell us? I mean, does it mean that we shouldn't worry <laughs> about um, uh, all the lifestyle factors? I mean, uh, um, <laughs> Um, well, there's well. one of the so some uh, some people have accused us of having McDonald's fund our our uh, work. <laughs> and advocating the cheeseburger diet. We're not, right. we're not advocating the cheeseburger diet. No, no. It, it turns out that um, Matt Allison at University of San Diego showed that as actually um, actually from Pittsburgh actually 
um, showed that if you, uh, in women, for example, prior to menopause, the risk factors they had, the dearth of risk factors predicted a dearth of calcification. That is, the smokers had more calcification eight years later after menopause. The people had lower the lower blood pressure had less calcification. So the classic risk factors do predict calcification. So unfortunately, we can't go whole hog. The traditional risk risk factors still work, but I think we're we've got it one defined. The, um, the, the, the other the, another answer to that question is that no, that then since you can only control some of your risk factors, our, our study may show that genetics or some other factor is more important than we used to think. But uh, it's all the more reason to control the risk factors you can control, mm -hmm. smoking, cholesterol, exercise level, uh, blood pressure, and so forth. Well, we know that genetics are important in heart disease. For example, South Asian, um, uh, South Asian uh, Indian population have, exactly. have, have, have uh, significantly higher rate of type 2 diabetes. Right. Uh, and that's the part of India that's desert which has um, variations in, in climate, uh, rapid variations in climate and food supply. There has been some theory that type 2 diabetes is related to those sorts of genetic factors and, and certainly in the UK the safe BMI level is lower for people of South Asian uh, mm -hmm. uh, population because of that type of factor. Egyptians live in a desert, a, a desert mm. with, a, with a wildly varying food supply that is dominated mm -hmm. by the Nile. Perhaps we're dealing with a, a genetic subset of population that are particularly um, predisposed towards getting heart disease. You're absolutely right. Yes, yes, that's you're right. Much yeah. more to be discovered in the tombs of Egypt. We, we, we can't really do functional imaging on these patients. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. They don't move. So we can, we can we scan them with a six light scanner that works just fine. And, <laughs> and radiation is obviously not an issue. No, so right. no, it's it, it's not an issue. You say there is more to be discovered. I mean, where do we go next? I mean, we can't we can't reanimate these people except in the movies. Um. The common man. I think we we again we've scanned the elite. Um, and so is it present in the common, common man and woman, for example? And so we're looking for caches of mummies um, that can be scanned uh, who are non-elite ancient Egyptians. Did, did they mummify non-elite people? Were they mummified? Not, not, not many, but there are some uh, mummies that were, some people that were naturally mummified in the desert. For example, um, they died in the desert. They um, were naturally desiccated and their bodies uh, um, uh, exist. So there's some a few a few cach caches and a few people like that uh, that we hope to get our hands on. We also understand in the Greek or Roman times, so the time when the Greeks were in charge, and uh, then the Romans in charge of that area, that mummification occurred up to about 20 percent of the population. And so that in that situation, we'll be able to get closer to the common man than the folks who worked and lived in the pharaoh's court. Okay, we had there was a significant Greek population, particularly that moved into to Egypt and Alexandria, for example. I mean, that's a famous Greek. Yes. yes. Did, have we got any mummies from there that come from a very different uh, genetic group uh, than the Egyptians? Could be, but one of the troubles in Alexandria is it's a damper climate, right? And you need you want a very very desert climate um, right. to be able to stay a mummy. Because if you think about it, I mean, it's unbelievable that. This mummy, for example, the first one with heart disease, almost Merit Amun, 3,500 years ago, you could, her friends could probably recognize her. And we wow. can say what disease she had. Wow. I mean, so to think in 5,000 AD that someone's going <laughs> to say, it's Rob Williams over there? <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable, the scientists that the, these folks were. And so you needed a, a unique, you needed they to be, the, the, the priest scientists needed to be terrific at their craft and then you needed to be in a in a desert and there's too much water up in the delta area for the we, for we, the mummies to be well uh well to have uh, done well for that long a period of time we, we do have mummies from the greco-roman period now they might have been greek descent we don't right. have, have that would be an interesting angle of research to be able to get the human genetics uh worked out maybe in the future that could happen yeah well uh, yeah we could combine the the genetics and the genotypes and, and see if that's, I mean, there's been genetic testing on mummies, right? Right, but it has some destructive right. element in it. So it's, it's difficult to do. It's not very easy, but it's not impossible.
Right, and CTing mummies has got no destructive element. Uh, exactly, they're not that's gonna why, that's why our radiation. work is very interesting. I mean, to get permission to scan this many mummies at the, at the what is this, for the U.S. folks, the Smithsonian of Egypt, yes. was just unbelievable. And so to be, we needed to do it in a non-destructive way, so that in a thousand years, they'll still be there. Right. And, and maybe we'll still be learning from them a thousand years later. Undoubtedly. <laughs> Secrets of the pyramids and the tombs. Okay. One Fantastic. In, one interesting point is that, okay, so we know that they had atherosclerosis, but we don't know whether they had the clinical disease or not. Right. So we looked at some of the uh, papyri, the, uh, the text of the ancient Egyptian physicians, and there is a very uh, famous one. Herbus papyrus, the name is right, Greg? Ebers, E B E R S. The yes. Ebers papyrus. And, and we find that they knew about angina. Oh. They actually gave a very uh, careful description of angina as we know it. So they faxed that if you have pain in your chest and going down your arms, you're going to die. Wow. They didn't have treatment then, I guess. No treatment, no <laughs> drugs, no <laughs> drugs, no bypass, but they, but no nuclear imaging. No statins. <laughs> but they observed, <laughs> they observed the prognosis, though. That's right. First step. Wow. And so interestingly, first step. the Egyptian, um, the doctors only treated diseases they could treat. They would just say, you're going to die, because their reputation was poor if they, their patients were treated died. So if you had chest pain going down your arms, it was over. I think that still applies today, doesn't it? We can fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Well, I mean, uh, uh, high-risk patients tend to be uh, shuffled around in, in my hospital, I find. Oh, I see And they end up in the nuclear <laughs> medicine department quite often. There we go. There <laughs> um, we go. So um, I don't think things have changed that much in terms of, uh, in terms of um, doctors wanting to... Uh, there we go. Uh, to, to take the uh, take the um, the easy way out, but I mean, there's lots of lessons here to be learned. If we know that they've had angina, we know they've had heart disease. We can look at calcium scores. We can look at the genetics, and we look at it over a very long period. That means that we can really start to apply that in modern man to work out, you know, what's really important in heart disease and what isn't. Perhaps aren't we really trying to look at you know, protonomic um, treatments to tailored to individual people, and this may yes. be a way, uh, you know, give us some clues towards that. So some it's, clues. Yeah. So we, we call it paleocardiology, and uh, the book hasn't been written yet, but I think it's got legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, very, very interesting. And uh, and what other sort of thing? What's next? What, what are you doing next? What's 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 up? What's coming along next? Um, finding. Uh, common ancient Egyptians or any other mummies, maybe natural mummies, as Randy was saying, and trying to, to, to see whether uh, the disease was found in common people. In Peru, uh, they've, there's mummies in Peru, isn't there? I mean, they right. did, did uh, they, uh, although it's again, another <coughs> desert environment. There is, right? there, is, there is some mummies in the oasis in Egypt. Right. Right, hundreds, if not thousands. So if your listeners have access to some mummies, give us a call. We'd absolutely <laughs> love to collaborate. <laughs> Please, uh, th this is so, fascinating yeah. stuff. And, uh, and, and, but not as in really just plain interesting, but it does have some real impact, you know, and, and it's, real, it's real medicine as well. The other thing that I use this on a, almost a daily basis, when I see a, a patient newly diagnosed with heart disease, they often blame themselves. They think, well, if I'd done this, I'd done that, if I'd done exercise, if I hadn't gone to the, had this sort of diet, and I say, it's been around since the pharaohs. And that there are things we can do um, to help you medically. There are things you can do to help yourself. But blaming yourself isn't going to do you any good, and these people had it back then. I came home from our, um, one of our first expeditions, talked to a patient, and he says he'd had heart disease and peripheral vascular use for 20 years, and he said, it gave him peace of mind that he didn't cause this, that it's a genetic hand-me-down from ancient times. Yeah. And perhaps it was a protect... I mean, perhaps in some ways it's thought that it was a protective hand-me-down to deal with, uh, to, you know, particularly the diabetes aspect was a protective hand-me-down to deal with a variable diet. So people actually put on weight to help, help them get them through the lean times. Mm.
Mm. And uh, we're not living in lean times uh, to that extent anymore. Mm. Mm. So, um, so you know, um, what, so I, you know, I think that is interesting in terms of in terms of go, and that's a good message to take home to all the, uh, the cardiologists out there that uh, um, to counsel the patients, do what you can do. Uh, there's a, but there's only so much that you can do, and there's only so much that uh, um, uh, that that you can be blamed for, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. Very good. Thank you. Fun. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, buddy. Nice. <laughs> right. Good job. Thank you. It was okay. fun. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you again for uh, listening or watching the podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. It was very interesting for me, and uh, I'm sure you've enjoyed that. Uh, stay tuned for the next interesting episodes and next interesting interviews on the podcast. Let me know what you think. That's rob at nukecast.com. And from now, goodbye from uh, Amsterdam um, in the Netherlands. And coming up on the podcast, we're going to have interviews with um, a physicist in Japan who, who's looking at uh, new heart disease. But more importantly, uh, he's going to talk about his experience in Japan. We're going to talk to a cardiologist, a nuclear medicine physician, who was um, on site, first physician on site uh, at the nuclear reactor and, uh, and the terrible tragedy that ensued there. I'm sure you're going to find that absolutely fascinating and some surprises there uh, about what really happened and, uh, and what, uh, what real, uh, really caused tragedy there that was most unexpected. So um, I'm sure you're going to find that absolutely fascinating and that'll be coming up soon. There's also future episodes dealing with uh, how in your daily practice you can, um, uh, with the existing data on your existing systems, um, look Look at cardiac resynchronization therapy, how you can guide that. We're going to look at uh, CT, how that can be integrated into your practice. Um, and we're going to look at um, uh, a time of flight calculation for PET um, and how that's important. Uh, we're going to look at new reconstruction algorithms, how they've changed um, since we looked at them previously on the podcast. We'll look at new traces and how they can revolutionise medicine, not just nuclear medicine. Uh, how close are they um, and what are, what are they going to tell us about? about heart disease. Um, we'll look at new stressing agents. We're going to find out um, uh, about uh, new gamma cameras and uh, new types of gamma systems um, that can help us uh, look at the heart. Lots of things are uh, coming from Nick, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. I want to know whether you find the video format useful or whether we should just stick to audio. I'd like to know whether you think we should have higher quality video on your device. Um, tell us, see what you think. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and also, of course, if you've got anything to contribute to the podcast, I'm sure you do. I'm sure there's lots of tales coming from your part of the world that can tell us about what you're doing in nuclear medicine, please get hold of me, rob at nucast.com, N-U-C-C-A-S-T dot com. And of course, tell your friends, tell your colleagues, go to nucast.com, subscribe in iTunes, uh, download all the episodes. The previous episodes uh, are important to the ones that are coming up, particularly on new traces because we're following on for that and particularly on uh, new reconstruction algorithms because we're following on from what we've learned on previous episodes. Um, I'm sure you'll find that really fascinating and interesting. So um, uh, catch you soon. Um, cheerio from now.